Welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction. So I hope you guys had a great week and um, uh, everything has been going well. I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, it was a busy weekend for us. We did our first ever egg retrieval in Windsor and we were super excited about that. So my sincere gratitude to our entire amazing, amazing team of people. Um, so lots of likes for them, uh, lots of thumbs up. We want to give everybody a big shout out who uh, helped to contribute to making this uh, dream uh, a reality. And uh, we had excellent results. Five of the embryo, uh, five of the eggs which were mature fertilized. So we got 100% fertilization and four fertilized 2 p.m., which is normal, one fertilized 1 p.m. So uh, very, very good results. We did a second one today. Um, for a patient where we were just trying to kind of help her out and actually ended up with a whole whack load of uh, very, very good eggs. So uh, we're hoping that's going to have some amazing outcome as well. So a uh, huge shout out to my team. Thank you all. Lots of uh, uh, likes and thumbs up and uh, uh, amazing work team. I love you all uh, and you guys were all amazing. So, uh, you know, fertility is an amazing field to be in. And it's uh, great to have knowledge and to read and to get to interact with the patients. But I am only as good as my team. And my team is incredible. Both our Sarnia team and our uh, Windsor team are uh, made up of amazing, amazing people. Um, all the way from our pharmacy, all the way to our nurses, to our manager, to our technicians, our ultrasonographers, our lab. Um, both the blood lab side of things and the, uh, um, the actual scientific lab part of things where we're doing the actual procedures. Uh, my colleagues are amazing, Mary Pattinson and Dr. Pattinson, and uh, it's just been an incredible experience to uh, have had the opportunity to get this up and running. So thank you again to everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing to be part of, so uh, super cool. Uh, okay, so tonight's topic is uh, a very interesting article. Um, it is a couple of years old, but uh, I came across it looking for some information uh, because I want to come up with a video that I want to call Embryo Math, and it'll be basically trying to give you a rough uh, estimate of what your chances of success are based on your age and your history and the number of embryos that we would anticipate you producing and then the number that would anticipate being normal and how many of even the normal ones would miscarry and so on so that we can give you some pretty valuable helpful data so that you guys can have the information that you need part of that is having a reference which is if you're just a patient who's trying and you don't even necessarily need fertility therapy yet you just started trying what are your chances of success and how do they relate to your age and so in studying this i managed to come across an article from the american journal of obstetrics and gynecology also better known as the gray journal because it's got kind of a grayish cover to it um, and it's called age and fecundability in a north america uh, north american preconception cohort study so in this group, what they were essentially looking for within the U.S. population, and they actually used Canada as well, so I love that because obviously you all know I'm Canadian and we're located currently in Canada. We're opening in the States in the summer. So we wanted to see what are the chances of success if you're trying on your own? How good are the results? Do you need fertility therapy? At what ages do we need to start being concerned about the outcome? So what these guys did was they went out and they established a protocol where they started searching for patients to include in their study. And it was called the PRESTO study and that stood for Pregnancy Study Online. And what they were trying to do is assess the natural fecundability, which is your chance of getting pregnant per cycle, um, or the, they call it the risk of getting pregnant per cycle, um, for patients who are just naturally conceiving. So obviously they had some specific criteria. Eligibility was you had to be female, 21 to 45 years old, you had to be a resident of the US and or Canada, and you had to be in a stable relationship with a male partner. So they were not looking at same-sex couples here, and that's important to know. Um, and obviously that was just for tracking of patients that were not using fertility assistance. And, and obviously with our homosexual clients, um, we can't do that without some degree of assistance, both on the male and the female side. So they weren't looking at that specific population in this study. 
And studies do show that there are differences in their success rates, so that's important to kind of segregate out from this pool. So they um, allowed the women who were brought into the study to then include their partners if their partners were older than 21 years of age um, and had reasonable health status. Uh, they recruited 5,249 women who completed the baseline questionnaire. They did exclude some women because they didn't know when their last menstrual period was. Um, there, were some, there were some that had been trying for more than several months, so they started wondering, are those patients maybe not as fertile? So if it was more than three months at study entry, they excluded them. And they excluded couples that had a known history of infertility. So you're basically trying to take as healthy a reproductive age population as possible and say, hey, if you guys are just trying on your own, what are the chances that you're gonna get pregnant per month as you go through your attempt? So um, I'm gonna share for uh, some of the viewers on our uh, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitter platform, some of the data so you guys can see that for my friends on instagram we tried to get it up there for you we're gonna have to practice with yellow duck a little more before we can get it to work uh, maybe for next week um, and we did try it ahead of time for some reason it's not working right now so yeah, as you can see in the graph here um, there's some interesting stuff uh, to look at they have the mean age of the partner as they went through their life uh uh, cycle so age 21 to 24 for the female mean age of the males was just a little older 26 goes up in kind of three-year increments um, women 25 to 29 were paired with guys that were almost 30 30 to 34 was 33 for the guys and 35 to 39 was 37 women 40 to 45 had an average age of partners uh, male partners that were 40. Um, when you look at uh, the number of women with regular cycles averaged around 55 percent in the younger group as they got a little bit older actually the cycles uh, more women had uh, regular cycles as high as almost 80 percent in the 40 to 45 group which i found interesting because some women actually start becoming irregular at that stage um, mean body mass index reasonable in the 28 to 29 range so pretty typical of our north american population uh, maybe a little bit healthier than average uh, they looked at other things which I'm not really sure are too important like income and so on. Uh, relatively low percent were smokers when they were in the older age groups. The highest percentage was in the 20 to 20, sorry, 21 to 25. 12% of the women were smokers there. Um, interesting data on alcohol. The younger women had less. The women that were older had a bit more. Um, so that was kind of interesting to find out. And then frequency of intercourse, less than one time per week, uh, was only 10% between 21 to 25, went up to 16.5%, then 24%, then 34.8%, and then 39.5% when the women were 40 to 45. So as they aged, there was a higher proportion of women having less sex. And then similarly, when they looked at the women who were having intercourse more frequently, more than four times per week, um, it was kind of the reverse. That was much more common in the younger population, uh, much less common in the older population. So the next thing that they kind of looked at here was um, the actual outcomes. So they broke it down into two groups. There's the group that has essentially um, six cycles of trying and a group that had 12 cycles of trying and then they adjusted based on all of the confounding factors. So here's the really important thing. They use the 21 to 24 year old age group as the reference level. And they said that over six cycles, your chance or percentage chance of success was 56.8% and over 12 cycles, it was 70.8%. As you went through the various age groups, so you're going from 21, 24 to 25 to 27, 28 to 30 and so on, the chance of success in both categories, six months or six cycles and 12 cycles, started to quite significantly fall off. So in the six cycle group,
group, by the time you're getting to 37, you're down to 46% from 56.8. But when you get to the 40 to 45 year old group, it dropped down to 27.6%. When you were looking at the 12 cycle group, it went from 70.8% in the youngest women down to 55.5%. Now it is really important that you guys all understand that this is the percentage that became pregnant. It is not the percent that had live birth. Remember in the 40 to 45 year old age group, you're probably looking at somewhere around a 50 to 60% chance of miscarriage. So that 27.6% within six months is really almost less than half that. You're probably looking around a 10% live birth rate or maybe even less. When they adjusted this in the model, they actually said that by the time you get to 37 to 39, you're getting a 40% decrease in chances per month compared to a woman who is 21 to 24. And when you are 40 to 45, your chances are actually 60% less than a woman that is 21 to uh, 24. So definitely you're seeing a decrease. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, the guys actually make absolutely no difference based on their age. So when they analyze the men, they showed that there's no difference in the age of the men, even when they were going over 40, although they did mention that a lot of their men were not over 40, so it's hard to extrapolate. And we do have data that demonstrates that there are changes in the quality of the sperm, the DNA fragmentation, and so on for the guys. So this is really, really important to understand as well. The other thing that they looked at was whether or not being pregnant before made a difference, and it did. So when you looked at the women who had never been pregnant before, the nulligravids, and you can see it in table three in this study, if you were in the 40 to 45 year old age group, you were 80% reduced compared to the last data that I showed you, which showed that you were only 60% reduced. Uh, but when you were looking at exclusive, exclusively the women that have never been pregnant before, you're actually looking at an 80% reduction. If they had been pregnant before, it was a 52% reduction for that 40 to 45 year old age group. So the important data from all of this is, or the important outcome of this is, your age does have a significant impact on your success rate. The older you become, the lower the chances of success, and it is statistically significant, and the numbers are important. So if you're looking at it when you're really young, you are seeing as high as a 70% chance after a year of you becoming pregnant. Some of those patients will miscarry, but it's pretty low at a 20 year old uh, age group. But by the time you're in the 40 to 45, you're looking at probably uh, even after a year of trying around somewhere between 10 to 20% chance maximum. So these are really, really important numbers to include when you're doing your own calculus of how long should I try for, how many times should I try, when should I seek help, because you have to know the numbers before you start diving into treatments that are potentially expensive. Really great information that came out of COVID and there hasn't been a lot of good that's come out of COVID, but one thing that did come out of Italy was that they noted that patients with unexplained infertility actually were starting to get pregnant much more frequently during the, the lockdowns. And the whole explanation or understanding behind it is they're actually home having more sex. So they're saying now that maybe some of the patients that were previously unexplained aren't actually unexplained. They actually just needed more time having more frequent intercourse. And so these are some of the things that we need to include when we're talking to patients, because there are patients that come in that don't need treatment. And if you don't need treatment, you shouldn't be getting treatment. So is it a factor of, or a fiction that your age is important? It is a fact as a female that your age is important. But the data is actually quite reassuring that most women have a reasonable chance even once they're over the age of 40. Does that mean it'll be easy? No. Are there women that have diminished ovarian reserve and will run into trouble? Yes. But it does mean that there's a chance. And remember, as long as you're willing and you're open to various options, there's almost always a chance. It's very, very rare that we can't actually help anybody. If you look back at our fact or fiction from a few months ago, a few weeks ago actually, we reviewed the study that showed that if you have three genetically normal embryos, even without doing any fancy treatments, intralipid, steroids, heparin, any of that stuff, 
you have a 95.2% chance of having a live birth, guys. So very, very important information for everyone to know. And uh, hopefully you uh, like that part of the show and, and uh, will find that information useful. As always, like, comment, share. A big uh, round of applause to uh, Tarek for trying to uh, get our uh, system all up and running all on one. Um, sorry that didn't work out, but uh, uh, hopefully a great topic. And uh, definitely give us comments. Let us know what your thoughts are.